thank you for coming along and going on a ride with us into these discussions. And now there's a new topic that's a huge, huge discussion. We're going to turn a right angle into another domain of the Arantia book, uh, different uh, aspects of its science and history, in particular history. And Hal Kassen, you can read his biography. He's uh, a guy with a lot of training. He's both a, a trained lawyer and has an MBA in business. So he's a very good analytical mind. And he's taken his uh, analytical tools um, and with a lot of guts, he's gotten into this uh, controversial areas of history, genetics, and many of the topics. And he's the publisher of ubethenews.com, highly recommended. It has 30 essays of his, and you're going to hear some of the essence of that work uh, right now. Uh, I think that would cover it. So, Hal Halbert Katzen. Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, start by, you know, creating the context here within our event. It's evolutionary revelation. So, um, where do I fit in into the evolutionary revelation picture? Why am I here? I'm here because the Urantia book says something in particular, and then we'll uh, talk about the role I've played in relationship to these statements. So let's, let's start with uh, uh, a couple of statements from the Urantia book. The laws of revelation hamper us greatly by their prescription of the impartation of unearned or premature knowledge. Mankind should understand that we who participate in the revelation of truth are very rigorously limited by the instructions of our superiors. We are not at liberty to anticipate the scientific discoveries of a thousand years. We full well know that while the historic facts and religious truths of this series of revelatory presentations will stand on the records of the ages to come, within a few short years, many of our statements regarding the physical sciences will stand in need of revision in consequence of additional scientific developments and new discoveries. So this sentence uh, at the end there, where it talks about the historic facts will stand on the records of the ages to come. This is uh, a key sentence in the Urantia book because uh, this is a sentence that establishes how a superhuman quality of uh, credibility can be objectively verified over time. And when we're dealing with something that purports to be an epical revelation, something of that nature, you know, is, is perhaps something we should expect. You know, if this is an epical revelation, if it's for the whole world, it's not just, a, and I don't, when I say just, I don't mean yes. I mean, if it's not only a personal revelation, those are very important, but personal revelations are not necessarily revelations for the whole world of an epical nature, right? In, in these few statements, we can already see the setup for what it means to claim uh, to be an epical revelation within the context of the Urantia book. What does the Urantia book mean by it? Well, when it says uh, we're not at liberty to anticipate the scientific discoveries of a thousand years, you know you're dealing with periods of at least a thousand years, right? An epic. Something big. Okay. So what this is set up is a claim of authority. The authors claim that their historic facts will stand on the records of the ages to come. So that presents a question for us. Do we believe it? Do we believe it? Do we accept this authority or not? What authority do we accept? Why? Or related questions. But this one... Um, is for us with this book. You know, do we accept this book as authoritative? Why or why not? Um, and so that's what the UB the News Project is really about, is uh, looking at what uh, history is in the book. And, and let's uh, take a step back here. The Urantia book, the middle third of it is the history of Urantia. The last third of it is the life and teachings of Jesus. So right there, we've got two-thirds of planetary history is, is the Urantia book. The first third is cosmology and theology, things of that nature. So obviously, history is a major consideration. And let's ask why, just for a moment, and reflect on that. Um, 
origin stories are tremendously important to humanity. These are the types of things that bind us and make us feel connected and you know, common to each other. And, and so this is not a trivial you know, consideration at all. These are the types of stories and beliefs and issues that unite and divide people. So if an epical revelation is designed to help unite humanity, uh, having a common understanding of who we are and where we came from is a natural uh, part of that process we may want to consider. So um, the You Be the News project, uh, I, I started about um, 2006, 2007. I got on the road with it. I traveled for uh, several years uh, documenting how new discoveries and scientific advances increasingly support uh, the history in the Urantia book, giving a lot of presentations, writing reports. And it, it got to the point where um, enough was enough already. And why was enough enough already in, in terms of my role? What I was doing that was distinct in the evolutionary development of how people relate to the Urantia book and this issue of whether or not new discoveries are catching up to and does this give it a quality of superhuman credibility or not and everything. I, I didn't uh, you know, start this consideration. Uh, people like Phil Calabrese had written the coming scientific validation of the Urantia book, uh, using his null hypothesis theory to um, establish that. Uh, there was a conference about 25 years ago where Urantia book readers got together to address themselves to these issues. What I did that was different was present this information for people who were unfamiliar with the Urantia book and unfamiliar with these areas of science or, uh, or discovery. And to use this information as a way to intrigue people about the Urantia book and to take an interest in it. So up until then, the conversation was much more for the in crowd. And before I got involved, um, we also have to remember the, the internet has been tremendously helpful to this type of work. We've had all kinds of scientific discoveries in the last uh, several decades that have been really great for the Urantia book. The last several decades have been great decades for the Urantia book. But as much as that, we also now have the technology to study the book well, you know, search it out, and also to get information quickly. So. Uh, my predecessors in this you know, line of work had a much more difficult time of it. And uh, you know, back in the 80s, when they had their you know, first conference, big conference around this thing, the, the internet even wasn't in existence, really. So they uh, really had a much bigger challenge. And one of the things that happened at that time period and coming out of that time period that I think is worth mentioning is that because they didn't have the research tools that uh, we have available to us today. Uh, coming out of that 80s time period into the 90s, 2000s, some of the research didn't hold up. And, and things that we thought were cooperations and support weren't because, in fact, human beings had documented this before the Urantia book was published or things like that. And so I set about to very rigorously try to determine what the truth of the matter was with all of this and to really uh, do it just as, as well and meticulously and kind of like a lawyer, you know, like really research it out and if you had to prove it up to someone, you know, what would you say and is, is the evidence there or not? So I, I brought a different level of discipline to it that way. Um, I'd also mention that my undergraduate degree was called the Nature and Development of Religious Experience. I worked in a multidisciplinary uh, program that way. And so all of this was sort of ripe for me to do. It wasn't, you know, just by accident. I felt like uh, I, I had the uh, background to tackle something like this. Uh, it had been talked about in the community for a while. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if someone did? And I found myself with the time and opportunity uh, to do so. So the, um, the reports uh, have summaries so that people can uh, get a quick understanding of, of what a report is about. Um, and as more and more reports got written, they started to fall into different types of categories. And, uh, and as you know, I got several in each category, that's when I started to feel, you know, more and more reports, it just becomes redundant after a while. 
And I was getting to a point where the information was coming in much more quickly than I could write spoon-feeding type reports about it. Um, and so that led to, uh, you'll see here we have the names of reports, and then you have some in brackets. The brackets are research pages. That's where I grabbed the relevant uh, text from the Urantia book. I grabbed the links to the scientific literature that had come out, uh, gave a quick presentation of it, and said, here, you know, have fun, as compared to, you know, what I was doing in the first several years, where I was really taking the time to explain every detail to everybody. So you can see here uh, it's divided into, uh, you know, two lists, one by time, one by topic. Uh, some of them don't fit into the timeline, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, this is supporting the history. For instance, um, we, we talked about the galaxies, uh, and, and they predicted something in the future. So that report is, you know, not so much about the past, but the future. Uh, and then um, the one that I want to point out here uh, that is outside the, you know, regular cooperative type reporting that the UB, the news project, has become known for is um, the, where is it? Must be here somewhere. There it is. Eugenics Race in the Urantia Book. The um, sort of beginning and end of this project, uh, and I didn't plan it this way, but it, it really uh, started to revolve around this issue of genetics. Now, in 1955, we were determining that there were 46, not 48 chromosomes. That, that's where we were at back then when the Urantia book was published. We had not come along very far at all, right? So here we have a text that describes in detail when major genetic shifts occurred in uh, human evolution, the populations that developed out of those shifts, where they migrated to on the planet, who they mixed with, all this rich detail that now genetics is starting to give us scientific information about. And so it, it really uh, is an especially sweet area uh, for us as uh, Urantia book readers who believe this stuff, you know, because it's a whole area of science that just wasn't even developed at the time that the Urantia book was published. And then, uh, so the Adam and Eve report is the first uh, report that I ended up writing for the UB The News Project. Now, interestingly enough for me, uh, was I didn't plan it that way. That is, I started to do the UB The News Project. I made a commitment to do it before I even knew that this cooperation existed. And when I put out the word that I was doing it, someone sent me an article that got me started on it. So you'll see why it's so exciting right away. I, we're we're going to get to this. And, um, you know, for me personally, uh, to have something like this handed to me right at the beginning of the project, you know, I knew there were going to be some things out there for me to write about because people had come before me. So I knew I had some work. But it was a faith journey, you know, and, and before that journey even really got started, um, we got the Adam and Eve report. Um, I guess, yes, I have one more slide before I get to that. I just want to mention uh, regarding that eugenics race in the Urantia book um, report. That's not a cooperative report. That is a, um, a scholarly study of what's in the Urantia book regarding eugenics and race. Um, what happened was reports like the Adam and Eve report and also the other one we're going to focus on today, the Gobekli Tepe report, uh, that involves an archaeological site in Turkey. These reports have a lot to do with genetics. And so they were taking people to parts of the Urantia book that have to do with human genetics and superhuman genetics, that is, you know, uh, genetics that are not altogether human. And um, we're going to get into that, of course, here soon. Um, and I started to feel bad about the, doing so. That is, it's, it's such a rich and complex area of the Urantia book. 
And it is, I was taking people, you know, to parts of it, giving them little snippets, and I knew that they weren't getting the big picture, and I just felt irresponsible about it. So we, um, we set off to uh, do the eugenics race in the Urantia book uh, paper to address that issue. And this was the first time that anyone had ever um, tackled that, that subject um, comprehensively and especially addressing the most controversial parts of the Urantia book. Um, this is about 100 pages long, or a little over 100 pages long. Um, it does not have a summary. There is a reason for that. I started to write a summary for it at one point, and, um, and I stopped because it, this is really one of those subjects that's you know, ahead of its time, and it will push buttons and raise issues you never <laughs> even thought about. And uh, I'll tell you where, you know, oops, where's, stop that. Uh, you, you see this chapter seven, what's a subnormal human being? What's that mean? Huh? How's that defined? What, right? I'm not going to tell you right now, but I'm going to tell you, you better read the first six chapters before you get there. <laughs> Don't just go running into something like that. This is a revelation. It's not an affirmation. It will affirm many things that we already believe, but something that's here ahead of its time, you know, created to last a thousand years or more, it's going to push on us and it's going to raise thoughts we never considered before. So uh, I just want you to reflect on that. You know, this is one of the great challenges of the Urantia revelation is that um, I should say, it's hard to be objective about this type of thing. Let me give you an example. When Jesus was here, the Urantia book teaches that um, he ordained women to go preach the gospel, right? And most people today, when they hear about the Urantia book, they love to hear that, right? It makes sense to them. All right. Now, the apostles, when they skipped over that part, didn't write that part up into the Bible and didn't practice it, were they consciously thinking, look, we really love Jesus, we love our master, but we're kind of ashamed about these teachings that he has about women, and we're really not man enough to, like, man up to him and live them out and, you know, spread the gospel with this, you know, truer understanding of, of the revelation that he taught us? No, they make excuses. That's what people do. There are all kinds of reasons uh, they wouldn't accept what Jesus said, and they had all kinds of rationalizations for it, and they were right in their own minds, Right? And this is what will happen with the Urantia revelation, too. Same thing. We will come to it with preconceived notions, ideas, beliefs that we hold dear. It will not affirm those. Maybe we didn't even get to the part of the book that, you know, says these things that don't affirm what we believe or think or feel. And we'll just start to project onto the Urantia book whatever we already think and believe <laughs> because it's resonated with us in, you know, some area that we did read. And so I just want to, um, you know, heads up that way to everybody. Um, approach this with an open mind and without presuming that you know what it says before you actually read it and, and do the work. I was reading the Urantia book for well over 20 years, over 25 years before I did this report. I did not understand this part of the Urantia book until I did the report. So um, enough said, let's get to the Adam and Eve report. Um, around 2004, five, six, uh, out of the University of Chicago, there's a researcher named Bruce Lawn, really top rate researcher. Um, I, I forget which periodical came out with this, but it was one of these like 
top 40 people under 40 who are going to change the world, right? And like Bruce Lawn, as a geneticist, was one of these people, right? And um, he got to work studying a part of a, a gene uh, known as a microcephalin gene. Um, and so microcephalin is responsible for brain growth, okay? Microcephalitis uh, causes the brain to not grow. Um, if a child gets that kind of disease. Um, and his research showed that about 37,000 years ago, an extra piece of genetic material was added on to the microcephalin gene. Like there's like a little Y there, you know, an extra piece on the gene. You can see it. And so he thought, well, that's interesting. Let's study that. So he did. And his research indicates, well, let me uh, back up here a second. This is uh, of interest to your ranch book readers because your ranch book says that Adam and Eve's genetics enhanced brain function and that they were here 37,848 years ago. So this is where the parallel starts. It goes on that his research uh, concluded that it was a single source that introduced this new genetic material into the human population. And with the Urantia book, we've got a single pair of humans, or superhumans in this case. Um, his research indicated that it came out of Mesopotamia. Uh, the Urantia book is specific where Adam and Eve lived in Mesopotamia. <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, his research indicated that um, this uh, gene did not make it into sub-Saharan Africa very much. Uh, just a very small percentage of the population down there has it. The Urantia book says that Adam and Eve's descendants did not, for the most part, venture down into sub-Saharan Africa. In um, studying the extra piece on the microcephalin gene, they also studied the other parts of the microcephalin gene around the extra part that got put on there. And they uh, determined that those uh, parts of the gene coalesced back to a million years ago, or 990,000 years ago, which is significant because the Urantia book indicates that humanity began a million years ago. So obviously that's a pretty nice start, isn't it? If you were looking for, you know, cooperations in a field of science that wasn't even invented at the time the Urantia book was published. All right, but there's more. There's more. It, it's not just that Bruce Lawn's work with the microcephalin gene showed this pattern. Um, there were also uh, Y chromosome genes that they were studying that showed a similar pattern of migration and positive selection. That means moving quickly into the human population, like by intent, right? Um, and as well, follow-up studies uh, showed that the development of non-tonal languages also followed the migration pattern of this addition to the uh, microcephalin gene. Um, Non-tonal languages are like English. Tonal languages are like Chinese, um, where you uh, have to inflect the word in a certain way in order to give it its meaning. Um, a non-tonal language, you can just say it flat, and it's still got its meaning. So um, that also is significant because the Urantia book recounts how Adam and Eve's descendants migrated around the world and spread their language and alphabet and civilization. So all of this stuff uh, tracks quite beautifully. Um, and then, I, I, and let me just say quickly, I also, I, I met Bruce Lawn on my travels. Delightful man. It was really a special experience uh, to get to do that, you know, to work my way into his office. It wasn't easy. I won't go into the story. We don't have time for that, but it was great to meet him. And we had a long talk. We talked for about 40 minutes or so. You know, I just popped in. He had time for me at the end of the day. And things were going great that way. And, and, a, and a few years later, I uh, went to look him up again and try and get back in touch. And he wouldn't return any phone calls or messages. And I was like, oh, heartbroken. And 
God, Bruce Law doesn't love me anymore, and I thought we got along so well. You know, <laughs> taking it all personal. And then I did a little more research, and I found out that he got slammed. His whole line of research got shut down because the white supremacists got hold of it and said, see, this just proves everything we've been saying all along, and the patents that the University of uh, Chicago was going to file on his behalf in support of the techniques that he had used to do this research and the continuation of the project, all of it just got shut right down. And I was reading articles about Bruce Lawn saying, you know, I came here from China to get away from this stuff. I can't believe, you know, this is what's going on. All by way of saying, it doesn't matter whether it comes from science or it comes from the Urantia book. There are things that people don't want to hear that is the truth. And people have trouble dealing with the truth for all kinds of reasons. And so we need to remember that because this is a spiritual problem first. It's very interesting to talk about how new discoveries are catching up to the Urantia book. It's a great and interesting topic. But it is not nearly so interesting as the things that get in the way from really appreciating this type of information. And there's lots of them, you know, and that, that's where all this spirituality really meets the science, I would say. Um, the other uh, thing I want to point out here, uh, the, uh, one of the things we did in that um, eugenics race in the Urantia book uh, paper was we put a taxonomy at the end. Um, oh, I also want to mention, too, uh, Andrew Myers is in the back there. He was my mentor uh, for that uh, paper. Uh, Andrew is my fiance Claire's son. And, uh, and uh, long-time Urantia book readers there, second generation. And, uh, and this is really a, a specialty area of Andrew's, and he was extraordinarily helpful to me in, in writing that paper and, and uh, coming up with the creative and, and uh, critical ideas. The taxonomy um, was something I did uh, with another gentleman. Some of you may have heard of Chris Halverson. We put together something that would try to help create a, a bit of an interface between the way you know, science thinks about human evolution, taxonomy, and so forth, and, and what the Urantia book says. And in doing that, um, we came up with some terms that uh, will be important as we get into the, the latter half of this presentation. So reading from the bottom here, Eve did not suffer pain in childbirth, neither did the evolutionary race, neither did the early evolutionary races. Only the mixed races produced by the union of evolutionary man with the nodites, which um, in the taxonomy we call Homo sapiens trans erectus, and later with the Adamites, Homo sapiens ultra sapiens, uh, did they suffer the severe pangs of childbirth? So the Urantia book says that the plan was for Adam and Eve to procreate, and their children would have children, and their children's children would have children, and they would get up to about a half a million descendants. And then at that point, when there was a half a million descendants, these beings who had come from a different planet, Adam and Eve, to genetically uplift the race, not take it over, uplift it, their half million descendants would go and mate with the human population and provide us additional genetic material that would make it our lives better. It was important for the process to work this way because mixing Adam and Eve's genetics directly or the genetics of their most direct descendants would produce problems like the pangs of childbirth that we read about right here. Okay, in other words, we can, the plan is we can get some advanced genetics, but not too advanced, right? There's good and then there's too much of a good thing, right? And things have to be done in order and as they're planned and timed. Our 
genetic uplifters defaulted. You know, we've got this story. There was trouble in the Garden of Eden. They had to leave. Not everyone was happy with how things went. There were problems, all right? Whatever it was, you know, this is, in a sense, how it's reflected specifically in the Urantia book, how some of these issues develop and occur. So um, now we're going to look at another report. This is the, um, this has become the most popular report on the UB the News website. Um, it's the most popular report because it has to do with an archeological discovery uh, from 1994 that has become tremendously uh, popular in, in the culture. And that is uh, the Gobekli Tepe site in Turkey. Um, what's incredible about Gobekli Tepe is that this site, first of all, it's only about 5% excavated. They've got monolithic stones um, with, you know, ground penetrating radar and everything like they can do now, right? They're looking at around 200 megalithic type stones, like they can be 15 to 20 tons, 20 feet high, in a time period dating from 9,000 to 12,000 years ago. This is twice as old as Stonehenge or the pyramids. This is in a time period when human beings were not supposed to even be agrarian, right? Still hunter-gatherer. So this uh, site is just blowing everyone's minds in the field of archaeology who's willing to look at it. And the more you look at it, the more mind-blowing it gets. So uh, here's, uh, you know, close up, you can see how these are arranged in circles and there's two bigger ones in the center and it'll often be topped off. And you can see that they're uh, decorated. You know, there's carvings, animal carvings. And here's the kicker. The deeper they dig, the bigger the stones and the more ornately they are decorated. And this whole site was intentionally covered over. Gobekli Tepe means like potbelly hill, right? So you've just like got a hill out there because people build it to cover up this. So archeologists and anthropologists are wondering what is up with this? This just blows all of our theories. What does the Urantia book say? Well, the Urantia book says, Adam and Eve lived in Mesopotamia starting 37,000 years ago. Their genetics are retrogressive, in a sense, towards the human, right? They come from a superior, humanly superior genetic. Adam and Eve's is superhuman genetic. But after generations, it gravitates towards the human. So you've got genetics on the decline, you've got a civilization that is more peaceful and advanced, and the Urantia book recounts how they're being driven out by the less advanced human beings in that region. So here we have an archeological discovery that created a mystery in 1994 that just is continuing to unfold and get more and more mysterious. And the Urantia books got an explanation for it before we even knew it existed. And um, just to show you, how, you know, as if all of this wasn't quite enough, uh, let's take a, a, a closer look, pardon me. We're gonna, yeah. Um, this is where um, it really becomes hard to not make point about how punny all this gets. The headless guy here with the erection on top of the bird, what does that mean? That means that um, women were actually stonemasons back then, and the issue of men thinking from below the waist and flying around like on top of the world, and no. Uh, <laughs> What this is about, um, before uh, you know, they ever discovered Gobekli Tepe or read the Urantia book or any of that, no. 
headless means that the person is deceased. That, that's what it's generally taken to mean in archaeology here when they find a depiction like that. Um, what's up with the giant bird? Well, the Urantia book says that when Adam and Eve lived, there was a species of bird known as fandors that was enormous and could carry people, and it was tamed, and it did, and they used them as transportation. Think about, um, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, the Indians, you know, the, the Krishna riding on, on the bird, and he's blue. Adam and Eve were said to have had a violet hue to them. So these were where, we, you know, the traditions overlap. So here we have at Gobekli Tepe, at the deeper levels where things are more ornate, we have the genetic god of former years represented on the back of the giant birds that they used to ride around on. Now, if you've got the Urantia book and you've already read that and you see this, you put it right together, right? And go, wow, you know, if you believe it, you're in heaven right now, you know, because you just got one of the great cooperations like the Adam and Eve. It's just like another wonderful thing. If you don't believe it, it's, I imagine, very intriguing, and you wonder how all this kind of stuff happened. This is a process that we're going through. This, you know, it, it's um, kind of like uh, aliens a little bit. <laughs> a lot of people are very comfortable to believe in aliens and to talk about aliens and to have a whole culture around aliens this and aliens that. But not everyone wants to go meet one. That freaked them out a little bit too much, right? And, and this is kind of what the Urantia book is like. That is, it's one thing to toy around with it and have a fun conversation with it and be inspired by it. And then it gets to a whole new level when it actually becomes compelling. And, and you take it on as a belief. And then you're in a situation where you believe that this is authoritative over what science says about history. This is authoritative about what happens after we die. You know, and this is the way that um, I believe the revelators are working with each of us kind of at our own pace, you might say, to bring us along when we're ready. One of the things that I think it's real important to reflect on is that um, it would not be a good, healthy, stable world um, if everybody like believed in the Urantia book as soon as they heard about it, right? If, if people were that easy to believe, this, this is not going to work, right? Okay, it's not going to work. So we've got a situation here now where over time, as we make new discoveries, uh, the Urantia book's history will become increasingly supportive, uh, as far as I believe. I mean, I've written so, you know, I've, I'm in the position where I've shook hands with the alien a lot, right? I wrote the reports. I can't expect you to relate to the Urantia book around this issue the way I do. That would be terribly unfair and wrong of me. That doesn't mean I don't have a superior experience of the issue, because I did the work. Right? You know, if you do the work, then you'll have that experience. And if you don't, you won't. And that's fine. You know, we're going to be in this flow for a while. And I just really want to encourage everyone, again, to reflect on what it means to be in these types of peculiar times where you've got a book making this type of claim. It's going to have all kinds of things that push on our sensibilities in different ways, different people for different things, right? <laughs> Slowly, this objectively verifiable superhuman quality of credibility is coming along, and it's there for us at this point, really. You can spend hours and hours and hours, and it, it gets really interesting. You saw those reports. They all have a story about them that is rich with detail and meaningful as you want to make it. So the UB The News website, uh, I want to finish up with a few remarks. Um, as I said, it was um, intended as a way to reach out to people who are unfamiliar with the Urantia book. 
So this page that you're looking at now is the page that you get to when you click on new visitors. And the thing I want to point out to you is right here, um, there is a button that will take you to syllabus material that I was asked to make up for a world religions class in Denison, uh, uh, um, Ohio, Denison University in Ohio. And, um, and so you have about 35 pages of the best of the Urantia book with a minimum of the, its cosmological terminology, you know, so it'll be easy for you to read. Um, and it really lays out the very best and most beautiful portrayal of our place in the cosmos and our whole evolutionary progression. Um, so uh, that's there for you. Um, the other thing is, uh, some of you may enjoy down at the bottom, uh, you'll see there's this uh, timeline, which um, will give you a, a graphic representation of when the new discoveries have been cropping up over the last several decades. And it's just kind of interesting and fun to, uh, to see that. But the syllabus is the main thing I wanted to, to point out. It's got some general information about the Urantia book, its history, but then it's also got the, the best stuff. And I, I think you really appreciate that if uh, you're new to the book. Um, the last thing I want to, uh, excuse me, end on now, um, going back here a second, you'll see where it says Urantia book. You can read the whole Urantia book online from this site, and when you click on that button, it'll also give you an opportunity to go to a glossary index section, and this is a a um, uh, little snapshot of that just to uh, show you what it's like. You can see that it's linked into the text, so you know you can go back and forth easily that way. The word agendanter has come up a couple times today, um, and I did an etymological study on that. I like to do etymologies where I turn it into a sentence syllable by syllable, you know, and you get your meaning out of it that way. So. It's all about the mental struggle, struggle for victory at the master's level for these gamers. <laughs> um, agony, you know, it's the agony of the Christ, you know, the, the challenge of faith, right? Agendanter is, means to believe without seeing. It's the term that designates those of us who are on a sphere that has become tainted by a rebellion. And so we're quarantined, and we don't have these superhuman beings that used to be on the planet that then we could believe with the sing, and it would be much easier and smoother, and we wouldn't, you know, question authority so much, right? But we question authority for a very good reason, which is a very bad reason. I mean, our angelic superiors defaulted and went into rebellion. Well, that's a good reason for those under them to be led astray. I mean, it's a sad one, it's a bad one, but you can see how that's going to work, right? So that's what we've got here. And, uh, and the Urantia book, as many people have said today, is, is here to help straighten that out. And I, I think it's really the challenge of the age for each of us personally, uh, as well as collectively. And, and the last thing I just want to make as a final point is that the Urantia book talks about us being on a brink. Of, of change, you know, like that we're really close to something. But it also talks about where we're at in terms of like being in a cocoon, right? Like you don't poke at the cocoon to try and get the butterfly to come out quicker. And by analogy, I want to say we're in times that not everyone's ready for the Urantia book. Most people aren't. You may not be. You may be. You know, but check it out for yourself and, 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 you know, try to be honest with yourself and try to be sensitive with others. You know, there's good reasons why we won't all get into this right away, even if it is everything it claims to be. There's good reasons for why it takes time. And we will all, you know, jump into that flow and swim in it at different points in time. You know, so uh, as much as, yeah, I think it's right and I believe it, um, I don't come here to you today as someone who says, believe with me right now, you should, everybody should believe like me. Um, I don't know what you should do. I don't know you well enough. But you do, 
And I, I hope this uh, helps you get to know yourself better and uh, helps you, you know, find all the guidance you're looking for and helps us all learn how to work uh, together more effectively, because I think that's the the two things we're really trying to needing to harmonize is our inner guidance with external authoritative guidance, you know, and, and where is that external authoritative guidance and how do we trust it and how do we trust our inner guidance and what is that? And these are challenging questions for us all to live with. And I thank you for coming and exploring it with me. Albert, um, we have a few minutes for Q&A. And some intriguing uh, points have been brought up. While we're waiting, I just want to say it took me about 38 years <laughs> to get into this aspect of the genetics and teachings in the Ranch Book because I came out of a left-wing uh, egalitarian political philosophy, and I just didn't like that part of the Ranch Book, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I just kind of put it aside. And now that I'm reading deeply and reading his writings, it's kind of amazing. It's really, uh, 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 just like the cosmology discussion, it's going to have a lot of discussion <laughs> happening for a yeah. long time. So um, why don't you come on up here if you have a question, please. Yes, uh, Roger. Hi. Um, I'm Roger Cotilla. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm basically here to see if I can get some tips because some of us are actively working on how we can stop nuclear war, how we can stop war, poverty, uh, violation of human rights, and all of the things that are going wrong. So my question to you is, uh, what are some of your tips in terms of what activists like myself should be looking for in this book in terms of how we can turn this thing around so that doesn't, isn't, you know, don't, so we don't end up in Armageddon? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. In three minutes or less. Yeah. Three minutes. I, I don't think I need three minutes for that. No. What I think the gentleman is bringing up is, you know, how does this help us be a better citizen of the world, right? How, how does all this spiritual belief stuff, and we can have all these cosmological thoughts and insights and philosophic this or that, and how does it help me live you know, better in the world. So, you know, the, this issue of, of um, say, nuclear weapons or any of the political issues of our time, environmental issues of our time, um, all of these things are things that we can work on as citizens. And it, it's not like we have faith and then that makes us smarter about how to live, you know, in better harmony with the environment. Now, what it does is it, it makes us more sensitive to that issue, right? That, that's, that's what it's going to do. It's going to help motivate and, and ground a person and energize a person to do better in all this work. What the Urantia book is going to do is, is provide perspective and insights about um, society and politics and the evolution of our culture. So, you know, the, the particular problem of the environment or nukes, it comes in a context of, you know, cultural development. And, and the Urantia book does have very specific commentary on the evolution of culture and politics. And so, you know, highly recommend that um, because that will upgrade our conversations and allow us to be better communicators about these problems. Anybody else? Okay, I just wanted to oh, just want to say one quick thing. Roger Cotilla, the questioner, uh, and I are on the board of directors of the World Federalist, uh, Democratic World Federalist, which is a global organization that is trying to get uh, world unity and eventually world democratic government. And Roger didn't know for a long, long time that I was, that I was motivated by the Arantia book to get into that movement. He now knows, and he doesn't mind then I'm pretty weird, and I'm on their board. And um, so to his credit, but uh, all right. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I just thank wanted you. to say thank you for your presentation. It's been sure. absolutely wonderful. And uh, I just, um, I'm very fascinated in the field of genetics and cellular biology and evolution. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, in the past couple of years, the idea of junk DNA mm -hmm. has been introduced to me, and um, it's just very fascinating. And thinking of um, the the do you, the atom atomite. How, what do you, how do you atomites? atomites? Thank you. I the always atomites. say it wrong. And um, so many scientists believe that the junk DNA is well. They don't know, but they assume that it possibly just might be waste or somehow stabilize the rest of our genetics and. Um, I've been very fascinated and just wonder if you have any thoughts on that or yeah. any... Well, the first one is um, there isn't junk DNA, you know, I mean, that just, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's their way of saying, you know, as you pointed out, we can't figure out what something is for and, and so, you know, we call it junk. All right, obviously that's not a very you know, insightful way to, to name something, but it, it does get, you know, to a point, which is that we're at the very beginning of all of, of this stuff still, you know, we're, we're really in early stages of it. And one of the things that um, I think is very challenging for the geneticists is the interface between the material and the mental, and the material and the spiritual, and you know, how that works exactly. And and so I think there's some things that are, it will always be kind of challenging for them when it comes to brain genes and, and stuff like that. And, and then the other issue is um, we don't know when, you know, it, if you take it that um, evolution has started, you know, like that the original genes, the way the Urantia book says, are designed to go through an evolutionary process that will be marked by um, mutations, right? Sudden mutations. It will, you know, get you from a dinosaur to a bird in one step. Okay. So, you know, what's waiting for us? Yeah. You know, yeah. right? Things like that. There's a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. And Thank you very much, because I've always looked at it as, is the glass half full yeah. or half empty? Yeah. And yeah, so thank yeah. you. All right. I, um, I've been reading a lot of uh, the literature, both critical and, and uh, proponents of uh, the transhumanist post-human agenda, which is a fully secular and technological Effort, whereby you know it's it's purported that a lot of these um, ascendant traits and also you know final states can be reached. Whatever aspect you want to comment on, from ethical or moral or spiritual, just tell me what you think about it. Yeah, um, great, great, great question. Um, <laughs> one of the things that the Urantia book comments on is how we're kind of stuck right now in a bad situation with our genetic issues. That is, we didn't get as much of the edemic uplift as we were supposed to get, and we don't have these superhumans on the planet to guide us in how to deal with the general gene pool and uplifting you know, human, human beings uh, that way. Um, for us to try and take that on ourselves, boy, doesn't that get dicey very quickly. People, you know, uh, have a lot of opinions on that and, and they want to be left alone as, you know, the individual freedom tends to reign supreme even though we're all quite interconnected this way, at least as an attitude. So we're in bad shape and, uh, and to what degree we're going to have to work this out scientifically, that is to actually go in there and change things somehow. Um, I don't know. What concerns me is that I think that uh, there's ways to work with our genes, you know, that is to manage our gene pool much more intelligently than what we're currently doing. Um, and, uh, and to uplift ourselves that way. And I think, you know, that's a, a better place to start at least because it's a little more sure. You know, we know that we're working with the basic genetic material we were given. We know that this was, or we can believe this was here to evolve in a progressive way. And, and we have all of our sciences of breeding from animal husbandry and we are animals. So we can 
you know, apply these things in intelligent ways to ourselves if we're willing and to whatever degree we're willing and can figure out how to do it in loving, respectful ways. That, of course, is the main issue. It's like not the science, it's that, you know, people immediately get concerned that, you know, someone will try and do something heinous with their great lofty ideals about, you know, the Uberman or something. You know. um, but really, you know, it, it, what's interesting to me about all of this and, and the repressed attitudes around the conversation is like, when I look out into the world, I see a world filled with violence and, and you know, politics that are, is acting out in, in bigoted ways, you know, reflects bigotry. Okay, I'm not sure what talking about it is going to like add to the problem or having discussion about it is going to add to the problem it because people are already acting this way. So I think we need to talk about it and, and just, you know, have more and more just straight conversation and, and um, we'll get there eventually. But it's it's tough. It's a real challenge. It's a huge problem. Uh, it has been suggested that. Um, the next uplifting might be the addition of an, an additional chromosome mm -hmm. and that there may be people among us that already have that uh, that have some of the outward appearances of autism. Mm -hmm. We see some extremely creative geniuses of people who are admitting that they are slightly autistic, especially in Hollywood, very highly creative people. From your experience uh, in looking at this project, uh, what would you um, what, what would you say that we as a group who believe that there is outside uplifting in the past and could be in the future to protect these young children because they're going to look different? Um. Okay, I tell you, I, I really don't. Um, have a, a strong opinion on that from a Urantia perspective. And, and the, the reason is, I think primarily, is that the, the Urantia book talks about, you know, like how we went from one race to six different colored races and the ideas were supposed to then blend and blend with the Adam in these genetics. And, you know, you get um, enhanced characteristics through the diversity of the genetics and then you can bring them back together and, you know, manage it this way. Uh, on the individual level, um, you know, that's sort of quite a different issue. And, and um, there the Urantia book to, speaks in terms of, you know, whether people are like socially unfit, antisocial, degenerate genes, you know, and, and how those need to be taken out of the gene pool, you know, that you can have, right? But this question obviously isn't that type of question. It's more like, hey, there, here's some genetics that have these, you know, special good qualities, and maybe there's some other things that aren't as well developed. And you know, what are we going to do with this? And and that's a little different, you know. So um, I, I don't think the Urantia book is too specific on that. We'll have to make questions and answers brief. So we got three more and uh, make them brief. And yeah, make the answers brief. Thank you. Okay. Just want to say for the war issue, there is a crop circle that the late, latest one was in Morse code and it said, no more war. But my question to yeah. you is, um, were you, was there anything that was a surprise for you as you created this amazing website and the drilling down the, and developing these papers? Were you, did you find something that kind of surprised you in all of your intense analysis and research? Um. N no, I, 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 um, I, I trusted the Urantia book going into this. You know, I didn't know how it would work out. So, like, I mean, the answer is like yes in the sense of the story I already told you that, wow, I started the project, and as soon as I did, someone, you know, showed me this article about, you know, the microcephalin gene, and, you know, and so... In one sense, yes, that was a surprise. And, and there's a bunch of stories of surprise like that, you know, just personal stories that, uh, you know, come along in life the way they do. But in the broad brush sense of it, with respect to the project as a whole, um, I, uh, 
I put everything into it with a lot of trust. I, I did, and, 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 and I also didn't just have trust. I had predecessors like Phil Calabrese and other people who, you know, did some of this work before me. So, it, and, it, and it's been great. It's, it's just been great how it's all come along. Well, thanks, Albert. I, I wanted to just make a, a couple of comments. One was, with respect to all this genetic inequality, some people have used that, uh, or they're very afraid to even talk about it. I think it's very important to lead with the statement that the Arantia book says we're all spiritually equal. And the reason for that is because we all have these indwelling spirits. So whatever the differences we have, genetically, culturally, uh, that doesn't mean that we can't uh, be spiritually equal, loved equally by God, and that they are actually needed. These differences are e essential in order to be able to help one another. In order to be able to love one another, we need to be able to do things for one another, do good to each other. So whatever the difference is, we don't have to be equal except spiritually. The other thing I wanted to just say was history, all that history, I thought it was science too. You know, I mean, I lumped those together because, you know, when we discover things about the past, that's, isn't that science? Well, let me make a quick comment on that. that what is the difference here? Because I think this is a key issue that, that uh, Phil brought up. I'm really glad he did here at the end, and maybe we'll just end on that. Um, here you see the, there's a, an astronomy, Tycho's Nova report. What is that about? The Urantia book says that there was a supernova uh, in the 1500s. It was so bright you could see it in the daytime sky. We know it as Tycho's Nova. And it specifies that this supernova was caused by a double star explosion. That is where you have two stars caught in each other's gravity grasp and the one you know, pulls matter from the other one into it and it causes an explosion as distinct from these enormous single stars that implode on themselves and do a supernova type explosion. So when the Urantia book was published in 1955, we did not even scientifically have this type of distinction uh, with the supernovas, that there's double star supernovas and single, you know, and to be able to tell which is which, that came along in the 70s. And so since about 1975, you know, they've shown that this is correct, what the Urantia book says. Did the Urantia book give us science? No, <coughs> didn't give us science. It gave us an historic fact. That double star explosion, like if you took your video camera to it, right, you would see a historic fact. You wouldn't see science. And, and this can confuse people. And then I think it's very important to try to be very clear. The Urantia book can give us history. That's not giving us science. And, and it takes science sometimes to corroborate the history, but that doesn't make the history science. 